thank you. Thanks very much for that very warm and generous invitation. I really do want to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Of course, I also want to say thank you very much to um, ABC Friends, to UTAS, Alana, for this wonderful venue for, for um, making the space available to us, and also to the Australian Institute of International Affairs, which first conceived of this trip. So it's, it's fantastic to be here and to be talking about a subject which I'm sure you'll agree, I'm sure you'll understand what I say, is very, very close to my own heart. Um, what we're going to be doing today is talking a little bit about the issues around frontline journalism. Um, one of the things, I, one of the points I really wanted to make is that while the focus is inevitably and necessarily going to be on journalists, on the people that are working um, and placing their lives on the line, on the front lines, this is not about journalists per se. This is about the people who depend on good journalism for their understanding of the world around them. This is about our ability to get good information, to have good solid public debates, public discussion grounded in the kind of information that journalism delivers to us all. And so while, as I said, this is at times may sound a little bit self-interested, it's not about us, it's about our democracies. That's the point that I think we heard just a moment ago and a point that I really want everybody to keep in mind as we work through this presentation. So let's start with this. I want to look at a few statistics first. And one, this is um, a list of the number of, or the, some statistics around the journalists that have been killed since 1992. This is, these statistics come from the Committee uh, to Protect Journalists, the CPJ, which is based in New York. And one of the points here about this, and I will, we'll talk a little bit about the shape of the graph in a moment, but the worst year ever was 2007 with 113 journalists that were killed. That's this, this point here. And th this is journalists and media workers. And by the way, these numbers are quite conservative. The CPJ defines journalists much more conservatively than other organisations like Reporters Without Borders. But it's also the one organisation that's been collecting these statistics over this period. So it's the ones that I'm, I'm relying on. Um, in 2009, uh, sorry, in 2023, uh, we saw 99 that were killed. And that's this number here. One of the things I want you to, to note, and we'll, it'll, it'll make sense when we look at the next graph, is the shape of this. So what we saw was a hump in the early 1990s when we saw some particularly bad civil wars in the former Yugoslavia, in Rwanda, the genocide in Rwanda, and the civil war in, in Somalia. And in a lot of those cases, most of the journalists that were killed there were local journalists who were killed as much because of their ethnicity as they were um, because of their role as reporters. And we saw this dip, what now seems to be a bit of a golden era for, for journalism or a safe period for journalism through the late 1990s. And then it started to rise in the early 2000s. We saw this, this hump here through the, through the teens. Things started to tail off around 2019, 2020, and now we've seen this more recent spike. And that spike toward in these last two years, 2022 and 2023, were really due to those two wars that I'm sure we've all been uh, monitoring, and that's Ukraine and Gaza. Gaza in particular has been spectacularly bad, and we'll talk about those numbers shortly. Here's the next uh, graph that I want to point you to, and this is the number of journalists who are imprisoned around the world. And I want you to notice a similar trend here. The hump in the early 1990s, then we see that gap, that dip, and then the numbers start to rise again around the early 2000s. They start steadily rising until we see the record numbers in 2022 and a slight dip in 2023. Again, I just want to say something about the way the, what these numbers actually mean. Um, the CPJ takes, when it comes to journalists in prison, the CPJ takes a snapshot on, on the 1st of December each year of journalists around the world. It's what they call their, their prison census. And that's because journalists obviously over time are being released and, and, and arrested. And so 
you can't really make meaningful comparisons by taking kind of daily tracker of journalists imprisoned. And so this snapshot helps us get an understanding of the way that the authorities are treating journalism more broadly. And in 2022, that high point was 367 journalists that were imprisoned. That's a record. Last year, it was 320 that were imprisoned on the 1st of December. And that number is a little bit deceptive because Iran, uh, which was the world's leading jailer of journalists in 2022, um, after the protests that followed the death of Masa Amini, um, they've released quite a number of journalists, but those are only pending, on bail pending sentencing at the time that this snapshot was taken. Just, so that, just to give you a little bit more detail about this, um, is, uh, we've got, um, how are we? That's it. China is the world's leading jailer of journalists with 44. Myanmar has 43, Belarus 28, Russia 22, Vietnam 18. But curiously, and again we'll talk about this in a moment, um, Iran is now equal sixth place alongside Israel with 17 journalists in prison. We'll talk about why in a moment. So what's going on here? That, let's just go back up a touch. This, the, one of the things I think we need to note is the turning point, the, the point at which things started to go bad for journalism broadly. And in my view, it's fairly straightforward. It is this moment, 9-11. So what happened in 9-11 was, what, let's talk briefly about the pre-9-11 era. A lot of the conflicts that predated 9-11 were conflicts over tangible things, things you could literally put your finger on, whether it's land, water, ethnicity, and so on. Now, it's always dangerous for journalists working in a front line, particularly when um, the kind of witness that, that journalists bring, the kind of eyeballs that journalists bring to, to conflicts is often inconvenient. But journalists were broadly accepted as observers rather than participants. Journalists weren't targeted specifically because of their profession. They were targeted because they were watching something that somebody didn't want or happened to be, see, be caught in the crossfire. But what happened with 9-11 was that it changed the whole nature of conflict into a conflict over isms, over ideas. Remember, George W. Bush declared the war on terror. And a friend of mine once joked that he'd launched a war on an abstract noun, a war on ideas that is impossible to win and even harder to end. How do on earth do you end or do you win, do you declare victory in the war on terror? It can't be done. But the crucial thing for journalists is the way in which that war on ideas translate into a war over the space that ideas are transmitted. And that is, by definition, the, space, uh, the media, the work that journalists do. That makes journalists targets in ways that we never were before 9-11, quite literally. And that is why we, we saw those spikes in both the number of journalists killed and the number of journalists arrested. Let me put a little bit more flesh on this. George W. Bush, you might recall, after 9-11, stood before a special joint session of Congress in which he declared, in this war on terror, you are either with us or you are with the terrorists. Now, that single statement turned the idea of, or the, the work that journalists do, into a binary choice. You are either on one side of the line or you're on the other. You are either with us or you're, we consider you to be an enemy. And if you do as journalists are supposed to, and that's interrogate all of the parties to a conflict, then by definition you are crossing the line and you're being regarded as the enemy. And what this did was change or it gave, gave license to governments everywhere to reframe national security as a problem of ideas as much as a physical problem. Journalists that were interrogating the ideas that governments were uncomfortable with started to be seen as a part of the national security problem and a target of governments. Anything that challenged governments' narratives became seen as hostile. 
And this is not an abstract idea. This graph is one, the last graph I'm going to inflict on you. Um, and this is about the, the way that the, or the CPJ's analysis of the charges that journalists are facing. Now, this green quarter, that green segment, um, is the charges, other, other charges. I'm not sure if you can read it. Um, but this is other. The number of journalists on other charges, I'll explain what other means, it means non-state charges, they're about um, 86. There are 66 on no charges, but this large orange segment is people that are on anti-state charges, journalists who are being charged with anti-state crimes. And by that, the CPJ means things like sedition, treason, broadcasting false news, and, yes, terrorism. What that tells us is the, ways in which, the way in which governments have, in, have, have come to regard journalism broadly not as a crime of defamation or a crime of, of uh, I don't know, some, some issue around um, civil disobedience or civil discourse. These are crimes against the state. These are national security crimes. The one final number that I'm going to ask you to keep in mind is the rate of impunity. Now remember those journalists that have been killed over the years? It's well over 2,000 now, according to the CPJ statistics. The rate of impunity, that is the number of crimes that remain, the number of journalist murders that remain unsolved, currently stands at just under 80%. That's eight out of 10 mur killers of journalists are, are, are walking free. And to me, that suggests that the authorities are either actively complicit or simply don't care. It tells us a lot about the ways in which journalism is regarded by the authorities and why we need to push back so seriously. Right, and this brings me to my own encounter with anti-state charges, and that's what happened to us in Egypt, me and my two colleagues. Um, we were accused, as you heard in the introduction, um, and ultimately convicted of being members of a terrorist organisation, aiding and abetting a terrorist organisation, financing terrorism, and broadcasting false news with intent to undermine national security. When you think about it, those charges are about as serious as you can possibly get, short of actively pulling a pin on a grenade and rolling it into the middle of a crowded room like this one. And so this is a critically dangerous period for journalism more broadly. What we were doing in Egypt was interrogating all of the interrogating all of the parties to the conflict, and that included the party that was pre had previously formed government, and that was the Muslim Brotherhood, the first democratically elected government in Egypt's history. And the ex they'd been ousted by a military coup six months before we arrived, and the government had started accusing them of being involved in acts of terror. At the time I was there, they weren't a prescribed terrorist organisation, but we felt that because they still represented the most significant part of... Egypt's political landscape, they were still important enough for us to talk to. And in talking to the Brotherhood, in interrogating their views, we, it seems, crossed the line as far as the Egyptian government was concerned, and that's how we wound up on terrorism charges. The other big trend, and I think this is particularly important when we, deals when, when we deal with the discussions around... Um, attacks on journalism is the trust in media because we have it's become fashionable in a lot of circles to accuse the media of being biased, to accuse the media of being propagandist because there is an erosion of confidence, of trust in the work that journalists do. Now I will accept that at least part of that is the responsibility of the journalists themselves. I think we've allowed our standards to slip in a lot of areas. But I also don't think it's necessarily all the responsibility or all the fault of the journalists themselves. Part of it is because online all information appears equal. And we know that the algorithms tend to throw us stories and information that confirms or engages us in ways that the algorithms think are likely to keep us 
coming back for more and that means giving us things that we like, that means we end up with a confirmation bias. And if the stories that come from unreliable sources challenge what we read in mainstream newspapers, mainstream media, we tend to get very sceptical and very cynical in a lot of cases about the journalism that we're being fed. And so I think the system, the digital environment that we're in at the moment has a huge responsibility in eroding the trust, but that's not all. Let's have just a very quick look at the numbers. The Edelman Trust Barometer found that in Australia, media is the most distrusted institution along, uh, behind the government, 45%, NGOs at 53%, and business at 54%. Now, the Edelman Trust Barometer is, has been tracking this over, over quite a few years. As you can see, trust generally is declining across the board, but the media in Australia is certainly in a particularly powerless position. I don't think it's deserved. I don't think it's warranted at all. I think that is in, in large part because of the problems that we've just been discussing. Now, I'm going to have... Um, I'm just going to get uh, our friend down to help us play this video. One of the main people that's been driving this, of course, has been Donald Trump. Trump has helped weaponize the cynicism of the media. He's introduced language into our discourse, into the political discourse that's made it appropriate, that's made it excusable for people to target, the, target journalism, to target the media in ways that we haven't seen before. And if we would have told you during the campaign that we would create 3.3 million jobs in the short time. Everybody back there, the fake news media, look at all of them. They're fake news. Everybody back there would have said, can you imagine He's saying we're going to create 3.3 million. Can you believe it? We would have been, but you know what? We understand. We understand. And, and today, today, in the history of our country, just came out, right? I'm sure we've seen, we've all seen those videos before. We've seen those kinds of statements before. But what it does is that it legitimizes from the very top, from the President of the United States, it legitimizes what I think are completely unjustified assaults on journalism as, in, as an institution. It is right that we are skeptical both of, of everything that we, we read online. But simply, simply um, attacking journalists because they're producing stories that make, that make our politicians, our political leaders feel uncomfortable is to attack journalists for doing precisely their jobs. That's what put us in prison. Now, we're not seeing that. We haven't seen that so far in the United States, but I think we're, we're likely to see things go far worse if and when Donald Trump takes over the presidency one more time. And so, in a lot of ways, this has, I think, legitimized attacks on journalism. This is something that popped up um, at one of the rallies. For those of you who can't read it, um, this is at a Trump rally, uh, Rope, tree journalist some assembly required it was on the back of a t-shirt uh, the t-shirt that was available freely online for quite a long time so how does this translate to frontline journalism well as i said it underlined and expanded the changes that emerged since 9 11. it created a degree of cynicism around journalists and it legitimized a lot of what would have previously been considered as completely unjustified assaults on journalism. To understand this, I want to go back to, to pre-9-11 when I was in Afghanistan. Um, this is a photograph that I took of the Taliban in 1995 when they launched their assault on Kabul. And at the time, it was the Taliban considered us as perfectly legitimate people to be on the battlefield. They didn't necessarily like us, they didn't necessarily or like my, my, my theology, they didn't necessarily understand it, but they accepted me as a legitimate part of the battle space. I often went to drink tea with the Taliban. 
Um, and this is at a time when, as I said to you, as I explained with the graphs, when we were seen not as participants but as observers. But if we fast forward to 9-11, to post 9-11, 2001, this is the coffin of a very dear friend of mine, Maria Grazia Cattulli, an Italian, wonderful Italian journalist who was murdered alongside four others in Afghanistan when the convoy that they were traveling in was ambushed by the Taliban. And the, everyone else in the convoy was allowed to go, but the journalists were all dragged out and they were executed in the hills around outside a uh, village called Sarobi. And this, and they were murdered, the, the people that were responsible for their murders were eventually captured and they were put on trial and they insisted that the reason that they murdered the journalists was because they were acting on orders from the Taliban to go specifically after journalists because of the role that journalists were playing in the conflict in transmitting ideas that were an anathema to the Taliban's work or the Taliban's beliefs. And that's the key. Again, this is about that war on ideas. So journalists started getting serious about uh, and, and more professional about safety. There, a lot of professional courses started to spring up, courses around battlefield first aid, around navigating checkpoints, situational awareness and so on. And it's become mandatory for most news organisations sending their journalists into battle zones to go through the kinds of courses that would have been inconceivable for anyone less than a combat um, or a combat soldier, someone who is a soldier who is actively working on front lines themselves. I want to go to the kind of I want to talk briefly about the kinds of risks that journalists are facing in these kinds of in these kinds of conflicts. Um, increasingly, journalists have to recognise when I was able to go in Afghanistan, we would put a, a huge label on the back of our Land Rover, a big BBC la label, and, and in, in um, Pashto and Farsi, we'd put journalist on there. And our vehicle, again, was always recognised. One of the reasons that I often crossed the front lines was because I wanted to fly that flag and make sure that both sides understood that we had no particularly partial role in the conflict, that we were not taking sides, that we were exercising our rights to cross the front lines, to talk to everyone involved. But now, if you try and do that, in a lot of, a lot of cases, you make yourself a target. This is a report about, what, um, about a Sky News team that was operating in Ukraine. The Ukrainian people are being attacked from the air, from artillery, from ground troops and tanks. The debris of this war litters every street. But the government has warned for days of Russian saboteurs who have infiltrated the country to bring terror. Death squads who are attacking civilians in their cars as they flee. They do exist, as we found out. Oh, that's a bullet. That was a bullet. No, it wasn't a bullet. It wasn't. Something blew up under us. Something went bang. Oh, okay. oh there's a big okay, hole. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, oh. oh. there's a bullet. Okay. Good. Good. Wait. 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 Oh! 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 We think it's a Ukrainian British checkpoint journalists! and a mistake, British! so we identify ourselves. British journalists! 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 Can anyone. Do you like to? Is everyone okay? You okay, Dom? And so the video continues from there. The team managed to escape, um, but not without some injuries, not without being wounded. The, cam the um, cameraman and the journalist himself were, were, were both wounded. Not seriously, they both survived, but it was a very, very serious incident. But it clearly underlines the ways in which the Russians in this case have come to regard journalism 
as a threat and have come to target people that, uh, that come to target journalists that are specifically identified. The problem is that for journalists operating in these front lines, they've now got an incredibly difficult choice to make. Do they try and hide their identity and make themselves as invisible as possible, in which case means you look very much like the combatants that you're working with, and that for any journalist, and I know that there are a few people in the few journalists in the room here, that is something that no journalist wants to do. That is not ethical. It's not generally accepted. The alternative, though, is to identify yourself, as so many do, with, um, with flak jackets, with body armour, with clearly marked press or TV, travel around in vehicles that are clearly marked, and then risk making yourselves a target, as the Sky News team was in that particular incident. So let's turn to Gaza. Um, more journalists have been killed in the first few months of this war than any other. Um, through the first 100 days or so, more journalists, uh, the journalists were being killed at a rate of almost one per day. That is an absolutely staggering number. We'll talk about the numbers in a minute, but I just want to see if we can play this next video, which will again, it's not going to show you anything that we haven't already, that we're not already aware of. Anybody that's been following the story in Gaza will know this. I want to emphasize that a journalist's life is, no, is worth no more than any other person's life in that region or anywhere else for that matter. But journalists are also paying a spectacularly high price. And in almost every case, the journalists that are paying for their paying with their lives are the Palestinians, because there are no other journalists that are allowed to operate in the region. Um, but remember, when everybody's heading away from a crisis, away from the shooting, it's the journalists that are heading towards it. And this is the result. A funeral service has been held in Gaza for Al Jazeera cameraman Samar Abu Dhaka, who died after an Israeli missile strike on Friday. Dozens of people paid their respects to the veteran journalist, including his colleague, Al Jazeera's Gaza bureau chief, Wael al Dadu, who was also injured in the attack. Samar was reporting from a UN run school in the southern city of Khan Yunus when he was hit by shrapnel. He later succumbed to his injuries. We were targeted directly by a missile. This is the behavior of the occupation. We are the colleagues of Samir in the profession of journalism and in Al Jazeera. We are always there. We are carrying this human message and uh, we are carrying this noble message. We will continue to do our duty with the best of professionalism. The speech goes on for quite a time, but it gives you a sense. Now, I, one of the things that I want to make clear about, about this particular character, the Al Jazeera bureau chief, um, well, Al Dadu, he lost his wife and two children and a grandson in an Israeli bombing on the 25th of October. In December, he was wounded in that drone strike that also killed his cameraman. And then on January 7th this year, um, he lost another son who worked as a cameraman and another journalist in another drone strike from the Israelis. The thing about what's happening in Gaza is the number of journalists, as I mentioned, that have been killed, 103 to date, that number is almost certainly an understatement. There are a number of journalists that are also missing. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, the way that we think of or describe journalists has been uh, pretty conservative. Now, I also want to acknowledge that obviously a lot of people are being killed in Gaza, um, not just journalists, and a lot of those who have been killed will have, will have died as a consequence of, of being caught in crossfire, being caught in bomb attacks that were not necessarily aimed at them. But um, the, the journalists are clearly, or it appears, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence to suggest journalists are being targeted. Now, Hamas, of the 103 that were killed, Hamas has killed four, is, killed four Israeli journalists in the original October 7th attacks. We also saw four Lebanese journalists killed in an artillery strike by the Israelis on southern Lebanon. Uh, 
um, there was an ongoing investigation into how that happened and why those people were targeted. But it appears there has been allegations that uh, the Israelis knew that the journalists were there that were monitoring things and monitoring what was going on and still launched an artillery strike on that position. And there are 95 Palestinian journalists who've been killed. Again, as I mentioned, a huge price, a catastrophic price that the journalists are paying. Now, there has been a UN human rights investigation into what's been going on. The, con the uh, inquiry concluded that the evidence suggests the killings, injury and detention are a deliberate strategy by Israeli forces to obstruct the media and silence critical reporting. This is from a UN investigation. Now, I recognise a couple of points. The Israelis insist, and I think with some degree of justification, that they are the only democracy in the region and that they have respect for media freedom. There is a lot of Israeli journalism that is deeply critical of the government that is allowed to continue to operate. But there are no Israeli journalists inside Gaza. Israeli journalists are only able to cover the conflict by being embedded with Israeli troops, which is inevitably going to give them a deeply skewed perspective. No foreign journalists are allowed in. Um, the High Court said Israel can continue to ban foreign reporters from Gaza, even though we've seen some formal requests from both the IFJ, the International Federation of Journalists, and a large number of news organisations who've all wanted to send independent journalists into the region. And so the only views that we currently have of what's coming out of, uh, of what's taking place in Gaza is reporting by Gazans themselves or the messages, the social media posts, the information that we get from either the Israelis or Hamas. And I'm sure anyone who's here would agree that we can't necessarily take those, those statements at face value. And so there is extraordinary pressure on Gaza journalists who feel a moral obligation to keep reporting and to document this conflict. So what are the rules for operating in a place like this? Um, one of the things that I, one of my approaches was what I came to call POE. And that means quite simply, piss off everybody. Um, I always felt that if I was covering a battle, if I was covering conflict, if one side was happy with my reporting, then almost certainly the other side would not be happy with my reporting and that suggested that I wasn't really getting it right. If I was being criticised by both sides, then I'd nailed it. Because in any kind of conflict, and particularly, if, and if you're a belligerent, if you're a party to a conflict, you will have your own very clear perspective on what's going on there. Anything that creates an alternative narrative to your own views is going to be seen as, you'll come to regard that as biased or somehow unreasonable reporting. And we've seen this so many times, time and again, I'm sure you've all seen the criticism of the reporting in Israel and Gaza. And so, you only know that you're managing things, you're getting it right, if you're upsetting both sides. That doesn't mean that you report complete rubbish. You've got to make sure that your reporting is accurate and is fair. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the myths of objectivity and balance. People always bring these ideas up. Um, the journalists who are here, will, I think, um, will, I'm sure, will recognise the problem of objectivity. When you're reporting in these kinds of conflicts, when you're making any kind of reporting, you are always having to make subjective choices. Every time, the questions you ask and the questions you don't ask are subjective. The order in which you place your information is subjective. We've all been trained to understand that the most important information goes at the top of a story. Something's got to go there. And then it, the rest of the information flows on from there. So what cho the choices you make about what is mo the most important is a subjective choice. Where you point a camera is a subjective decision. 
where you don't point a camera is also subjective. If you're a photographer or a cameraman, the choice of lenses that you use, the way that you frame it and focus it and light a story, are all subjective choices that will influence the ways in which those stories are read and received by your audiences. And so there is no such thing as truly objective reporting. There is objective facts. I'm not saying, I'm not advocating for alternative facts. And we have to acknowledge, we have to recognize that you're getting it right as long as it, your basic facts, your information is accurate, is properly checked, is fairly represented. And so the standards that we need to adopt when we're doing this kind of work, when I say standards are different, what I mean is that the measures that we use for success aren't around these, aren't necessarily around these things. And here's the other point that I really want to make when we talk about objectivity too, is that sometimes it is inevitable. I mean, if you're a Palestinian journalist, you are going to be reporting from Gaza from the perspective of a Palestinian. There's no two ways around it. You cannot produce a, a, a completely objective account of what's going on in a way, or, or a balanced account in a way that pays equal respect to the Israelis that, have, that are involved in the conflict, whether it's the Israeli hostages or the people the families of the victims who were killed in that original October 7th attack. But as a news organisation, you do have a responsibility to be balanced. You can take a report from Gaza, you also need to take a report from Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. And that means that we need to hold to the two truths principle. The two things can be true at the same time that the suffering that the, Isra the Israeli victims, or the families of the Israeli victims and the, and the hostages are experiencing is no more important or less important than the suffering of the Palestinians. I'm not suggesting necessarily there is equivalence here, but we have to pay due respect and understand the way that these two truths exist side by side. We also have to understand and accept the way that the truths of the politics inside Gaza and the politics inside Israel sit very uncomfortably with one another. These things exist, these things are facts of the conflict and they have to be acknowledged. But what happens in so much of the commentary around the journalism that we're seeing in reporting on this is that if, as a journalist, you somehow try and interrogate and understand what drives the Palestinians, you're seen as anti-Semitic. And likewise, if you report on the on, on the anguish and the, uh, that the families of the hostages are experiencing and the kind of pressure that they are putting on the, on the Israeli government and the complexities of the politics inside Israel that Benjamin Netanyahu is having to juggle, if you try and understand that, then you're accused so often of trying to justify the genocide of Palestinians. Now these two things must exist side by side and the reporting has to reflect that as uncomfortable as it might be. But that places the journalist in the position of POE, pissing off everybody. So what really, I, I think you've achieved success if you are faithfully able to articulate the views of all parties and as long as all of your facts are accurate and fairly represented. That is the gold standard to conflict journalism. Now, there's one other point that I want to make before we throw open to questions, and this is around a concept called the grey zone. The grey zone was articulated by an organisation back around 2007, and by this, the organisation, by the grey zone, they, what they mean is that space that allows nuanced debate, that space that allows us to accept and hear alternative views, views that might challenge our own beliefs with tolerance, without um, slipping into violence. It's the space that's absolutely essential for a democracy to operate. It's the space that allows us to live alongside people who are from different faiths, different cultures, different belief systems to our own, and still live in comfort and harmony. It's the space that journalists in particular and artists occupy 
that space that allows us to, for free and open discussion and debate. It is essential to our democracy. The organisation that promoted the, or that spoke of the grey zone was Islamic State. And this is the magazine in which they spoke of it. But they weren't talking about it positively. They were talking about it as... as a, they, were, they were talking about the extinction of the grey zone. That the whole point of what Islamic State was trying to do in launching its, its attacks was to create a binary world in which it would be impossible for Muslims to live alongside Christians or Muslims to live alongside anyone else of any other faith for that matter. They wanted to create that binary world, that black and white world. And the person that they quoted in their report, in this, in this magazine most prominently to, and in a way that said that this is exactly the point that we are trying to achieve, it was George W. Bush, in this war on terror, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. It's that binary statement that George W. Bush made after 9-11. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why I think journalism is so under so, so much pressure at the moment and why it's become so dangerous for journalists to operate in conflict zones everywhere. Thanks very much. One from the front here. Interested in your views with regard to Julian Assange journalism. There's a debate whether that's journalism or not. Um, his um, release of information, especially when the um, journalists were killed by the, the Americans from the helicopter and the person who was trying to save them, that was really confronting and was going against the narrative of the US military. So I'd just like to... OK, let, let's, let's go back to the two truths principle here. Um, let me first say that I am, I believe, Ju I, I want Julian Assange to be released. There is no justification for keeping him in prison. I completely support the government's resolution from a few weeks ago when they called for Julian's, Julian to be released for his ordeal to end and for him to be allowed to come back to Australia. His human rights have been abused. There's no two ways about that. Um, I think that he, it, it, it's been com absolutely outrageous that he's been in prison for um, uh, for this amount of time. I have some problems with, co with supporting the idea that Julian is a journalist. I accept and I agree completely with what WikiLeaks did when it came to releasing the collateral murder video that you've, that you've just described. Um, it was an absolutely crucial piece of evidence that we needed to see and it forced um, some very serious reviews within the US military and I think it was absolutely important, it was absolutely vital. But in my view, journalism is a process. It's not simply release, the release of information. Journalism requires you to place editorial oversight over the information you're releasing. That means taking out information that should not be in the public domain, that for which there is no public interest in, in seeing. Um, it means protecting the identities of people who have whose names should not be in the public. It means placing all of that information in context, in analy analysing it, doing more than simply releasing it. And that's where I have a problem with WikiLeaks' approach. Now, I accept WikiLeaks, the importance of WikiLeaks. I'm not challenging WikiLeaks. What I am saying is that I think that is different to journalism. What Ed Snowden did in going to the Guardian with his leaks, with the NSA files, I think counts as, to my mind, that's the right approach because the, doc, the, um, the Guardian and the other publishers that published um, Ed Snowden's files went through it with a fine tooth comb. They took out all sorts of pieces of information. Um, they wrote a whole series of stories. They withheld an awful lot that they didn't believe was in the public interest. Now again, I recognise there's a whole story around the reasons that WikiLeaks published so much of the, of the files that it did. But ultimately, in my view, you're responsible for what goes online under your own name. Um, and, I, and, and that's where I have a problem. But please understand 
that from my own perspective as a person, as an individual who's been through imprisonment, who understands what Julian Assange has experienced, I am wholeheartedly full square behind him and I want him out, I want him home. I think it, it, enough is enough. I'd like to know what you think about the Murdoch press and its effect <laughs> on the politics as much as anything else. Um, so I think there are an awful lot of good journalists who work for Murdoch. Um, the problem is that I think Murdoch has become a slave to the algorithms. Um, I think what Murdoch has done in fact, what a lot of news organisations have done, is find a niche in the digital world and do what, frankly, you would expect any business to do, and that's find a way of monetizing that niche. Um, the, problem, the problem is that the, the digital world prioritises or encourages, it supports polemic over sober analysis prioritizes, it rewards speed over accuracy. It rewards the sensational over the serious. That's how you keep the money flowing. And if you're an editor trying to figure out how to survive as a news organization, that's the kind of stuff that you'll prioritize. And what Murdoch has done, and we've seen it particularly in, in places like Fox News in the, in the States, um, and with I think with the Telegraph and the Australian, is that they've got a tribe and they tend to feed, they feed red meat to that tribe because they know that's what the tribe responds to. Now that's a hard-headed business decision. It's not good journalism. And it's skewed the politics of this country, of the United States, of the UK in ways that I think are deeply troubling and deeply dangerous. I don't mean to excuse Murdoch in this, but what I am saying is I need, we need to understand why it's happened and I think we need to figure out ways in which we can push back or, or at least change the dynamic of the environment, the business environment. Because if we don't, it's not just Murdoch that's going to keep using those strategies. Um, a whole bunch of other news organisations, any news organisation that wants to survive is increasingly going to have to go down that route unless we can find a way to change how we finance news and, and make it accountable to the public that it is meant to serve rather than the shareholders that it currently serves. Uh, thank you, Peter. Really interesting talk. I was just um, to, uh, thinking about Trump, and you said he acted as a catalyst for um, the sort of reputation damage that's occurred to journalists. But surely Trump is, is, at least in part, a creation of the media. The media fed his stupid well, ideas and gave it coverage when well, perhaps they shouldn't have. Yes, happen. and I think, again, that comes to partly to, to what I've been saying just now about the ways in which the algorithms have encouraged the news organisations and journalists to, to play to those algorithms, and Trump was a perfectly, was a brilliant tool for that. It's a very, it's a really difficult conundrum for journalists. If the president of the United States, or even a candidate for the presidency, says something completely outrageous about, I, know, I mean, what we saw in some of Trump's remarks around COVID, um, news organisations have an obligation to report that. Do you, they though? Sorry. They can choose how they might cover it. They can choose how they might cover it, and news organisations repeatedly, repeatedly fact-check Donald Trump around, um, around COVID. But Trump has a direct line to his supporters, and that's, that was through Twitter, um, through social media. And when he got bumped off Twitter, he created his own, his own network, Truth Social. And this is what I was saying earlier about the ways in which the algorithms support feed us information that support our own biases rather than accurate information. The algorithms prioritise attention over accuracy. That's what they're designed to do. And so if you're a supporter of Trump and you've shown your support through your, your social media or your, your, your online browsing habits, 
then you're going to get a lot of feeds from the kinds of people, the kind of political um, ideas that line up with your own. And that means when you get a story from a journalist that says, well, this is what the president said, but this is the context, this is why what he's saying about vaccinations, about COVID vaccinations is wrong, someone who's receiving that is going to look at that and say, well, yeah, I can see that, that that's bullshit, they're lying because I've got all of these other sources of information that tell me that actually COVID vaccines are deeply dangerous things, right? And this is one of the things, if we're going to fix this problem of the effectiveness of, of journalism, of the media, then we've got to start dealing with the algorithms and the way that they're designed. I personally disagree with the idea, if, and I'm going, this is going to take us off into a slightly different, uh, different field, if you like, but you've got to remember, the algorithms are not designed for us. The social media or the, the um, digital world has, is the way in which we now communicate. It's how we do business. Facebook in particular wants to be the medium by which we do politics and commerce and social debate and, social and, and socialise and meet and all sorts of things. But Facebook is not designed for us. It's designed to, to hold on to our attention to make profits for the shareholders in Silicon Valley. I'm not being critical of them for doing that. That's what Facebook does. It's a business. That's what it's designed to do. It's just done it spectacularly effectively. But it's not designed for us. And so that's why we end up with the, with the, with the feeds that, that keep undermining public debate, public discussion, rather than supporting it. We can redesign those algorithms in ways that support good public discussion, that support good journalism, that prioritise that kind of information that brings us into the centre rather than spins us off into the extremes. But that requires courageous government regulation and it requires the kind of public debate that recognises that this problem exists and that we need to change the dynamic. And I don't think we've had that conversation just yet. We're starting to, but I don't think we're there yet. But that, to my mind, is one of the, key, one of the keys to the, to the, to the problem. I, honestly, I don't know that there is a way that you can stop it short of going to the other extreme and that censoring. And this is where we wind up with a really difficult conundrum. We don't want to censor. That's a dangerous thing. Um, you know, there are countless debates about free speech, about how we, find, how we strike that balance between appropriate speech and censorship. Um, I wouldn't want to see a world in which we stop certain views completely from being transmitted. But this is also why I think we, I, wanna, I want us to recognise that everything we see on our social media feeds, every time we see something from, from Trump, it's curated by the algorithms that feed us things that those, the companies think we want to see. I'm, not, I'm starting to sound like I'm about to put a tinfoil hat on, but... Um, the fact is that that's what those algorithms are designed to do and everything we see on our pages is curated by definition by the algorithms. And we can re-engineer them in a way, as I said, that filters out or at least diminishes the impact that those stories and those crazies would have. We can't and we should not silence them entirely, but we can reorganise the ranking system to diminish that kind of speech and reduce its impact and reduce the threat to people like the, the judges that you've just mentioned. Should I just speak into it? Yeah. Um, I've lived in Australia for over 50 years, believe it or not, and uh, uh, up until maybe about 10 years ago, I used to be able to well, I, 
thought I, I could distinguish between legislation or regulation in Australia that was really tighter and different from American re non-regulation, basically, in, in the news versus entertainment field and in that whole realm of Fox supposedly being able to call itself news, but actually they have a license for entertainment and not news, really. They, they, legally, they, they, I, I believe their license is, is Fox Entertainment and people just getting sucked into entertainment. So could, do you think that there's possibly a way for maybe the ABC to inform the public just very generally and clearly what the distinctions are between <laughs> between the um, regulations yeah. because because like Fox is insidiously creeping into Australia more and more. I have friends who actually watch Fox News. The first time I ever saw Fox News in the States about 10 years ago, I didn't know it was Fox News. I thought it was an earlier edition of Saturday Night Live. I was <laughs> really, I was laughing and laughing and laughing after a couple of minutes, my friends, and they're still friends, but we had to work through some issues. Um, they, they, were, they were amazed that I was laughing at the news. I said, you know, this is hilarious. You know, it's it was a comedy act. Yeah. Yes. So what's, Look, what can Australia, what can ABC do? I'm, I'm not sure that the ABC can do anything dramatically on, on its own. Um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some ideas that my organisation, the Alliance for Journalist Freedom, has. And that's around what we think we need to... We, we believe that there needs to be a professional association of journalists. Um, I'm going to run you very quickly through our, uh, our ideas. We, we believe there needs to be a Media Freedom Act in Australia uh, that protects, that does the role that the First Amendment does in the United States by providing the kind of legal top cover, a legal principle that says that journalism and me free media freedom need to be taken into account at every stage of the process, both in drafting laws and in, and in um, applying laws in courts. One of the biggest problems is how you define the thing you're trying to protect. And we think the traditional role has been to define journalist. That no longer works in the digital world, but we want to define journalism as a process, as a way in which, as a way, uh, as a kind of system for uh, gathering, organising and presenting information in a way that's accountable to a set of standards and codes of conduct. And that's relatively uncontroversial. But if we can define it that way, then we believe that and this, is wh this is the bit that's going to start answering a question. I think you might be wondering where I'm going with this. But, but if we then set up a professional association that says that we will admit members who meet that legal standard, that, know, that demonstrate they know and understand um, the, the processes, standards, ethics and laws around journalism, we will admit them admit as members. They can then badge their work next to the byline the public can see and identify that journalism that's produced to a standard. You click on that little badge, that'll take you to the website, that'll give you a list of all of the people that are, um, that are members. Um, it'll give you the code of conduct, the code of ethics, all the standards they apply to and a way of complaining if you think they deviate from those standards. This is a voluntary system. Nobody is shut out, nobody is prevented from practicing journalism. If they don't want to be a member, that's fine. But if you are a member, you will also enjoy legal top cover. The courts will assume that you are producing journalism to that standard and therefore anybody investigating you it has a legal obligation to show why your, your journalism doesn't make the grade before they're prosecuting you. Now, the reason I'm saying this is we, we believe <coughs> that the part of the problem is, as I mentioned earlier, that journalism looks much the same online um, as not journalism. So by establishing a mechanism where we can identify people that are working to a standard, a professional standard, and hold them accountable to that standard, we give the public a way of distinguishing between the kind of Fox News style rants that's comment, that's opinion, but not journalism, and the kind of other stuff that we think makes that standard that makes the grade. If we can, make a cl if we can help the public clearly identify the distinction between those two things, then I think we'll have done two things. We'll, in, we'll be able to increase public confidence in good journalism, and we'll also produce a positive incentive for journalists to make sure they stay on the right side of that line, both because they would want to hold on to that membership and they would also want to maintain the kind of legal cover that goes with that. 
Now, this is an idea that we're starting to float in government. Um, it's controversial. There are a lot of people that think that this may be used as a form of accreditation. We don't believe it can or should. It cannot be a barrier to entry. It doesn't stop anybody from producing journalism or, or it doesn't silence anyone's, free, anyone's speech. What it does do is identify work that is produced to a standard and we hope will deal with some of the problems around public trust and confidence um, and also, as I said, produce a positive influence on, on journalism itself. Thank you.